Hello, Malcolm Brady, Dublin City University Business School here again. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about the um, business model concept um, and a Hambrix strategy, elements of strategy or strategy diamond com uh, model as well, those two models, which represent, in a sense, a, a nice summary of the firm and what it's trying to achieve. Uh, so we're in the analysis stage of our framework, the purpose analysis choice execution framework pace, and we're in the internal analysis. We're analyzing within the firm here at this stage. So this is our first foray into internal analysis. So the business model concept is, is a nice summary uh, of, <clears throat> in a sense, what the current strategy is, what the mission of the, it's a detailing in a sense of the mission of the organization. So um, there, it's, it's a phrase that's bandied about a lot in the public domain, uh, much of the time without any great knowledge of what it contains. It's just used as a phrase that our business model is this, our business model is that. Uh, so much of this usage is very casual. Um, also in the academic literature, there's a great amount of material written on business models and different kinds of shapes or frameworks for the business model concept. So I'm showing you here the Johnson um, et al. framework from Harvard Business Review 2008. So that's their particular framework. And it's, you can see it's a four element model here. I think this is a little easier than the more common, the commonly used Osterwelder strategy uh, business model canvas, um, which is, an, is a nine element model. And it really contain, contains the same ground as these four. It's just they've, you know, Osterwelder split up resources into channels and partnerships, as well as resources. They split the profit formula into cost and revenue. So again, increasing the number of elements there. And the customer value proposition, they um, create several different, three different elements out of that. So that makes up their nine uh, element model. But in fact, it covers the same ground as this one here. And this is four things to remember rather than nine things to remember. So personally, I prefer this one. So it's the one I recommend you, you um, you're using, <clears throat> but be aware of these other arrangements that are out there under the heading business model. As I say, there's a huge literature out there now on business model frameworks and different kinds of business models. So this one here has um, four elements, as I say. The starting one is the customer value proposition. And what you're looking at here is who is the customer? What's the target customer group? Uh, the, your ideal customer, what need have they got or what job have they got that needs to be done? So you're meeting some need, something to save, something to do with their time, to save them time, some skill that they, they, they you might provide for them or, um, <clears throat> or um, some other method by which you're providing them with some value. Okay, otherwise they won't want your, your offering. And then they recommend in this article that you do one thing well rather than do multiple things poorly. Okay, so concentrate on, on or focus on doing one thing well. So that's their, some of, in brief, there's the summation of their talk about the customer value proposition. So who is your customer? What do they need done? And then we go on to how you provide it in the, in the remaining boxes here. So um, <clears throat> Part of the provision, of course, is what you know is you with your organization requires resources in order to provide these this offering to the customers. So the resources can be people. There's a huge range of resources: people, assets, technology, the facilities you use, the equipment you you need in order to provide the product or service, and indeed all the ancillary uh, work that goes on to in terms of providing product or service. What actual products have you got? What channels are you going to use? As I say, Osterwelder expands this into a whole separate. Uh, category. What brands are you developing? What partnerships or uh, partners do you have in terms of providing the offering? Okay, we look at a company in a moment, uh, the, we look under each of these headings at a company case study in a moment. So these two are the value creation. You use your resource to create a value, to create some offering that provides value to your customers. So this is the value creation box. And then the other two are uh, value delivery and value capture. So you can see here, the delivery is through your processes, uh, what, what um, systems, activities, processes do you have to put in place in order to get this uh, product or service created and delivered to your customers. So they recommend that processes should be repeatable and scalable, particularly if you're, uh, if you're this is your business model for a startup company or a small company and you want to get larger, 
there's no point having a process that works really well when you're only doing it 10 times a week. But if you want to do it a thousand times a week, it just it breaks down. It, it's not capable of scaling up to a, that number, that size. OK, and that can be the case for many processes, artisan type processes, and, uh, you know, craft shops or craft works, cafes and so on. These often don't scale up very well, although obviously they can scale up. Starbucks is obviously is a coffee uh, outlet that has scaled up enormously. Um, but that requires um, serious uh, resourcing and seriously looking at your processes to be able to do that. The small coffee shop may not scale up, but it depends very much on local talent and that may not expand. They must be repeatable again. There's no point in being able to do it for a short length of time. If you're going to create a business, uh, it must be repeatable. So repeatable and scalable are two of the elements of the processes. And then they talk about rules, norms and metrics as well that must be in place for these processes to work. Um, particularly if you're looking to innovating uh, your business model, the current rules, the current norms, the current metrics may be restricting um, your ability to create a good offering. And looking at these rules in detail and altering them may allow you to create a new innovation. Okay. And then the final element is the profit formula. Um, and partly one of the values of the business model is it puts stress on the profit formula. There's no point having a great offering uh, identifying your target market, all of this sort of stuff, uh, offering your product, putting it out there, if at the end of the day you can't make money on it, you can't make a profit on it. A firm that doesn't make a profit won't exist, can't exist for very long. Okay, so there must be a margin. And um, so you need to look at your revenues, where are you exactly are you getting your revenues from, what are the customers paying for. This isn't always as clear as, as it sounds. For example, with eBay, you know, where do their revenues come from? It's not as clear cut as it seems. Um, 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 Uber taxis, uh, where is their revenue coming from again? It's not always clear cut where the revenue are, who's actually paying, okay? So that needs to be thought out. Where are your costs? That's more clear cut. Your resources and your processes typically make up your costs. Your margin is your profit margin, the difference between revenues and costs, um, uh, the ratio of uh, ratio of revenues to costs. Um, and then resource velocity is they, they recommend you look at how often you're turning over your 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 assets um, because uh, small margins but turned over many times a day can lead to quite good profitability. So it's not just looking at the margin but looking at how how rapidly you're turning your assets over, your products over. So there are the elements of the the business model, as I say, um, you'll see various different versions of this in the Johnson et al. Harvard Business Review 2008 is the one I'd recommend you look at. Here's an example now of the business model in, in practice. And you can see if you go to the slides themselves, you can get to a video clip on the business model explaining this model in more detail than, than I will now. But essentially their customer value proposition, excuse the typo there, waterproof, durable, the F should be under waterproof. Um, but essentially they produce a fabric that's waterproof and breathable and durable. Okay, but waterproof and breathability are the two sort of stops water getting in, but it lets water vapor get out, it lets your sweat get out. Okay, that's the key selling point of core fabrics. The customer is the apparel manufacturer here, not the final user, but the actual manufacturer. So North Face or Berghaus or one of these are the are their customers. It's aimed at the outdoor athlete more so than the casual wearer because it's quite expensive. So it's the runner, the cyclist, the hill walker, and so on that are the primary sailing people are targets for Gore-Tex materials. Um, they offer a lifetime warranty. It's quite expensive, so the warranty is, 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 is attractive. So these are all part of the value proposition. Then the resources that it uses, that it draws on to provide this value, um, were clearly um, PTFE or polytetrafluoroethylene is the is the um, material that the fabric is made from. So that's one of their resources, how to use that and how to use that in different ways. And indeed, Gore as a company um, use PTFE in many ways, not just to produce Gore-Tex, uh, the fabric, but, but lots of other uses as well. So design and manufacturing engineers are a key resource. And their direct sales team, because they're aiming at the apparel manufacturers, so the direct sales team are a key resource. They have a particular interesting lattice manif uh, management structure, which is uh, the, the, the writers here the label as a key resource, and they have a particular culture of innovation. And again, critically important. And then partners, I mentioned that can be a separate 
item under Aster Wilder, but the partners for them are the manufacturers themselves because they need to work in tandem with the manufacturers because the good, the Gore-Tex coat only works well if the Gore fabric, Gore-Tex fabric works well with the outer lining provided by the manufacturers. So they work with the manufacturers and they work with the military who obviously would be uh, important users of such a fabric. The processes, the key ones are design and manufacturing. That's no surprise. Uh, or and D mentioned culture of innovation in terms of resources, but their processes has to be, have to be good as well. Marketing to uh, business to, uh, um, business to consumer. Um, okay, that's a bit of a surprise in the sense that one would have expected marketing to uh, would be B two B, and then protecting their IP. They're very good at that. You, uh, Gore-Tex, Gore-Tex, Gore is a private company, so you can't see the profitability, but uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, a, it's um, felt that they are very, very profitable. Okay, They protect their IP very, very well. So these are the various elements of their business model. And then the profit formula, as I say, it's from, from the sale of the laminated fabric, um, and they also sell some equipment, and the cost is the design, engineering, manufacturing, and so on of that laminate, that fabric. Um, so that's really the Gore-Tex, the Gore model in, in summary. Um, I'm going to, and that's what I'm going to say about the business model concept. I'm going to move to a second concept that's very similar to the business model and uh, kind of uh, has an, as an alternative use to it. Um, some examples here of different companies working in the same industry, even with the same generic strategy, for example, low cost manufacturing, uh, low cost retailers, Aldi and Tesco, would both you know, would, be form, would be under the low cost label. But they're very, very different business models if you look at them in detail. So the, the uh, diamond model or the elements of strategy model here from Hambrick and um, Fredrickson it uh, covers very similar ground to the business model concept. So you could argue it's an alternative approach, a little bit uh, they've added a few extra dimensions that aren't in the business model, uh, which we'll come to. Um, so firstly, we, the, the, the center one there is the economic logic. You know, uh, how do they obtain their returns? Where do their costs come from? Where do their prices come from? Are they premium? Are they um, uh, <clears throat> as standard price? Um, uh, do they get scale economies and so on? So you're looking at really where, where, where the money comes from, where the returns come from. So this is not that different to the profit formula under the business model. Although they're seeing, looking at more economic factors um, uh, as opposed to just simply uh, where did the revenues come from? And they're looking at how are the revenues generated? What economic logic is underneath that? And um, where will they be active? This is in a sense your, your customer value proposition um, <clears throat> where to play it's sometimes uh, phrased as. So what products, what markets, what geographies even, uh, what countries uh, or regions are you going to work in? What technologies are you, going to, are you going to use to provide your product service? So they call that, they label that arenas. Uh, that would be similar to the customer value proposition. And um, how will we win? They call these differentiators. Note that this is a slightly different use of the phrase differentiation that Michael Porter uses in his generic strategies. They're basically saying whatever we use, different whatever, whatever we do that differentiates differentiates us. It may be even low prices could be your, your differentiator. So as I say, slightly different usage to Michael Porter. So essentially, what image have you got? Um, what prices do you set? What styles and so on? How do you customize your product? All of these elements, all of these factors differentiate your product, and in a sense, define how you will win. So where to play, how to win are the two main questions. How do we get there? And uh, what vehicles do you use? Uh, internal growth or organic growth? Uh, do you use joint ventures? Do you license it out? Do you franchise it out? Do you acquire other companies? How do you grow? How do you get your company, get your product out there? Um, <clears throat> so it's very much to do with growth. And then staging, their other um, final element. Vehicles and staging are not really part of the business model. They're more strategic as in how you get, how you achieve, how you make your business model successful. So the speed and sequence of moves. Um, in terms of expansion, in terms of new initiatives, new projects, and so on. So this is very much your strategy. And then we have a very quick slide on um, use of the um, uh, strategy diamond concept, or the elements of strategy concept by Hambrick and Fredrickson. So they give the example of IKEA. So they're, they're you know, uh, where to play is inexpensive contemporary furniture. Um, their aim is to sell it to young white collar customers, and they're, they're looking at a worldwide 
How will they get there? Well, they learn to get there through organic expansion. In other words, they, they don't borrow, they don't acquire, they use the funds they generate from their existing businesses to um, set up new businesses in new cities or new countries. Their stores are wholly owned, so they're not, as I say, franchising anything out or licensing anything out. They run their own businesses themselves and they use their own money to create their new businesses. So very clear um, approach here in terms of how to get there. How will they win? Um, good quality, low price. You've been in Ikea, you know the price is very competitive. A fun sort of non-threatening shopping atmosphere. It's not like going into a furniture store where you have to deal say, with salespeople and have to know a good deal about the kind of product. You can go in there and simply browse around. Um, and instant fulfillment, you, you go out with your trolley, with your flat pack, and you take it to your car and you go home with it. Okay. Obviously, the fulfillment breaks down a little bit uh, when you go home and you have to try and uh, assemble the product, but uh, certainly you get the product home straight away. Okay, so you're not waiting three weeks or three months for the item to arrive and be delivered to your house. Okay, you get it straight away. Um, <clears throat> Um, how they obtain their returns, uh, scale economies here is one of the things mentioned. In other words, their stores are very large, so they're getting some economies of scale in the store, but they also get economies of scale in terms of design and so on, um, and some supply chain, supply chain economies by um, uh, having so many stores. So there, there are a very large number of stores, and there are some economies of scale there as well. So the number of stores and the sheer size of the stores, as anyone who's been in IKEA knows, they're enormous. Um, and then the speed and sequence of moves, um, rapid international expansion, they've expanded very rapidly since their um, inception in Sweden, um, and they're pretty well in most major countries in the world at the moment. Um, obviously, they can only expand so far within a country because a country can only take so many IKEAs. Ireland, for example, has just one IKEA, um, um, but people will travel to an IKEA to purchase. And early footholds, and they fill in, uh, they fill in uh, any missing gaps later. So they they set up a store, for example, the Irish one in Dublin, and they may set up um, one later on in Cork or Galway. Okay, all right, that's um, the elements of strategy, Hambrick's Hambrick and Fredrickson strategy diamond model, and we also looked at the business model, uh, the business model concept predicted work by Johnson and um, et al. Harvard Business Review, two thousand and eight. Okay, so we're going to leave it at that. So thank you, thank you very much for listening.